Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Great. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning. Oh, no problem. Okay. I see a cool piece behind you. I'm very curious about it. <laughs> you do. You see one of the birds. It's, it's small and it's, um, you have similar works with the two toucans right. in them. So, yeah, that seems to be one of his favorites, huh? Well, I think he liked the arrangement of it. Yeah, the shapes. Mm -hmm. That's so okay. he, well, he mostly liked he mostly liked birds of prey. Really? Yeah. Huh. Like, Do you know why? Like, um nobody did. He liked vultures, he liked eagles. Hmm. And uh would almost when they went down to St. Mark's looking for birds, it's fortunate mother was in the car because he would look out the window driving along at vultures in the sky. So Zerba, that's German, I'm assuming. Um, German is Zerba. Okay. And when he came over here, it became Zerba. And down in the south, a lot of Zerbi. Mm -hmm. But we, we answer to anything. I mean, we're not, we're not pride, proud. Gotcha. So, so he was from Germany. Can you tell me anything about his German heritage? If he ever talked about it, if you ever went back together? He never talked about it. What I know about it is from reading articles that other people have written. Wow. And um, he was born in Berlin, but for the first 10 years of his life, he lived in Paris. So mm -hmm. he grew up speaking perfect French as well as German. And um, on the eve of World War I, his father moved the family back to Germany. Mm. And they lived in Frankfurt um, Main for a while. And then his father was killed at, right at the end of uh, World War I. So my dad would have been about 15, I guess, when he mm. was killed. He was killed in a bombing raid. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. So um, shortly after that, maybe a year or so after that, the family relocated to Munich where his mother was from and her family was from. And that's where he went to art school. And um, mm -hmm. he went to a couple of art schools there. He always wanted to be a painter. He knew he wanted to be a painter. And he called himself, interestingly, a painter, not an artist. He, I never heard him really? refer to himself as an artist. And uh, when he was maybe in his early teens, a friend of his uh, mother's gave him a set of tube paints, which he created one painting with squeezing them right out of the tube onto the, the board or whatever he was working on. And he really mm -hmm. wanted to be a, a painter after that. And there was the usual discussion about, well, you can't make money doing that. You have to do something respectable. His dad was an engineer. And so ah. for a brief period, he went to um, a technical school and learned, studied chemistry, which was interesting because, mm -hmm. because he had that chemistry background that got him open to figuring out the um, encaustic technique. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't bound to what that. everyone else was doing. He was open to let's experiment. And, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a, there's a myth and I don't know if it's true or not. You know, I have, every family has myths that he was studying chemistry and he was experimenting and accidentally blew up the family basement. And after that, they threw their hands up and said, go to art school. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, he was identified with the German expressionists. He also was um, very, very fond of Picasso and Brock, more probably more Brock given his temperament, but, um, he really liked Kokoschka. Um, he liked um, Max Beckman. Mm. And there's a story to that too. And again, it's 
it's a story I don't know for sure. They brought him to Boston, uh, Max Beckman to Boston to give a lecture series. And he came out to the house for dinner and had some kind of an argument over father's rose garden. And I don't know what the argument was, but um, it, it kind of cooled that relationship a little bit. But uh, you can see in the work he did in the 40s, the, the war years, the, that he was influenced by Beckman, by the symbolic expressionism. Carl Zerba was born in Germany in 1903. He was an intensely private man, and an element of mystery surrounds his early life. We do know that he briefly studied chemistry, that his father was killed in World War I, that he had his first one-man show in Berlin before he was 20, that he left home and traveled widely throughout Europe. Unfortunately, few of his works prior to 1928 have survived, though he certainly was by that time an accomplished artist. Okay, he, he was in Munich mm -hmm. and the brown shirts were in Munich mm -hmm. and the artists and the brown shirts clash just like college liberals clash with the education department. I mean, you know, there, there are just clashes. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was on that list and he was a quote, modern artist, unquote. You know, he wasn't, the, the Nazis were into much more realistic type work than, than his was. And um, so he was on that list. And um, there is, there are stories which I cannot document that he also had a Jewish background. Mm. I have my, um, his family back through my great grandparents and find nothing. But somebody did a um, thesis on the art group he was a member of in Munich and they tried to get into another art group and they accepted everybody except Zerba because of his Jewish background. Well, this is the first I had heard of this. I was 55, 60 when I heard this. I asked my father once when, when, um, when I was little, because we didn't go to church, I said, well, what was your religion? He said, I was raised Lutheran. Okay. And if you look at the uh, marriage certificates and stuff going back three generations, they, they were all Lutherans. Um, so I said, fine. He, he said this, I say this. And um, my friend who translated the stuff from Germany said in a very gentle voice, well, you know, Maria, at that time in history, you became what you had to be. And, and she said it was just a wide open time where you did what you had to do to survive. Now, whether he had any Jewish upbringing, I don't know. My dealer in Boston said, yes, he was Jewish never said that to me. So I don't know. Um, I don't care one way or the other, but I don't know. And I have tried to document it and I can't. And I wrote back to that um, German scholar and said, can I have your documentation on this statement? And I never heard back from her. So anyway, like I said, they had bought a painting at the National Gallery in Berlin in 29, I want to say. And in 33, when he made his decision to come over here, they had removed his painting. They were coming up with all the, the um, anti-modern art um, edicts out of the government. And he kind of saw the writing on the wall because he'd been in Munich and he'd seen artists being beaten up. And mm -hmm. he figured this was probably not a promising environment. So they, he, at that point in time, had the opportunity to come over here and teach for a year. Um, he had friends who gave him contacts so that he could teach and contacts for a show in New York City and a show at the, what was then the Germanic Museum at Harvard. So he came over for a year 
and uh, was debating, should I, he knew he wanted to leave Germany be, while Hitler was in charge. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't know if he wanted to come here or if he wanted to go to France, because like I said, he spoke French like a native. He was very comfortable in Paris. <clears throat> and he was kind of trying to decide between the two but he knew he didn't want to be in Germany. He was not happy about um, the way the politics were going there as far as you know his teachers and, and all that. So mm -hmm. he came over here, he met mother that decided him between the US and Paris. And if he'd stayed in Paris, he might've been dead. I mean, you know, cause they took over Paris and, and mm -hmm. You know, Picasso survived because he was Picasso, but who the heck was Zerba back then? Not, nobody that big. Mm. So uh, he got on lists. Okay, we grew up in um, Belmont, Massachusetts on a place called Snake Hill Road, which is now a national, um, uh, on the national registry, and they're not allowed to build any new houses or anything like that. And it was the brainstorm of an artist named Carl Koch, who want, was looking for a place to build houses. He had in mind to build houses that were relatively inexpensive. And Snake Hill is on a very steep hill with a, with a road that has two hairpin turns in it. And he was able to buy that property because nobody else thought you could build on it. So we were basically, the houses were on the side of a modified cliff and if you open the closets to the back wall you would see rock there yeah. and it was it was it was a very cool place and uh, we had uh, architectural students all the time driving up to stare at the houses and stuff so mm -hmm. but it was it mm -hmm. was very idyllic the the families all got together and we had common rules for all the kids and uh, they had a lot of get togethers and meetings and things. The families were pretty close, but it was only eight, 10 houses up there. Um, we lived there until I was 15. And so that would have been 13 years. That's a big influential time in your life, I'm sure. It, yeah, that, it was an idyllic childhood. It really was. It was, um, it couldn't have been better. Hmm. And did your father have a studio at the house or did he go somewhere else? He else? did. And, and he admitted toward the end of his life that that was probably not the smartest thing for him to do because I couldn't have kids over when he was painting because everything had to be quiet. And, um, you know, he thought it was a great idea. Hey, paint all morning, pop upstairs for a sandwich for lunch, go back to the studio. Uh, before that, he they rented a house and they rented two floors and lived on one and the, the other floor was his studio. Wow. So it was a similar situation. And your mother was uh, supportive of that, having that much space dedicated to his work? Um, she was very supportive of it. She dedicated herself to him, really. Um, she started out as an art student. That's how they met. Um, he was friends with her professor. Mm -hmm. And um, so they they tried while she was going to paint too, and that just didn't work. Mm -hmm. And she just, she dedicated herself to making his environment good. Do you know how long he lived in Indian Head for? Um, probably about 15 years. We lived on West Indian Head Drive when we first came down as that was supposed to be just a year. And then he bought the property and built. And I think it took him about two years to actually get the house built and move into it. You'll see if they haven't changed it. I mean, they might have changed it um, on the street below a Taffanine, which I forget what it is. Um, you'll see the the whole face of the house is plate glass windows, floor to ceiling. Oh, wow. Yeah. Good for bird watching. <laughs> um, good for bird watching. And um, there was, 
in the middle of the uh, segregation movement, there was an artist, an African-American artist who came probably to A&M uh, for a visit, for a lecture or something. And uh, father invited him over for dinner mm -hmm. and they had to cancel it because there were threats. Oh. And the police looked at the house, which was plate glass windows <laughs> and said, no, clearly, clearly this is not a good venue for, oh, for yeah. this. Huh. So um, A&M might know more about that than I do. I was not living at home then. So gotcha. I just heard snippets. Interesting. So the civil rights really had a big impact on him. I can well, tell. Well, kind of yes and no. Um, he, he had a heart attack. He, we didn't have TV in the house until he had this heart attack. And then just to keep him occupied when he had to be quiet, mother put in a television set and it was right around that time that they were having the lunch counter sit-ins and the bus boycotts and all that so in that regard he watched the local and the southern um movement and did the albany georgia series and and a bunch of other things from that he had in um let me get my dates right he went down to Jamaica. They wanted him to move down there. He went down there in, I think, 61, 60 or 61, and um, was already thinking in terms of the, the tension between the, um, the African-Americans and the um, white people. And noticed that there was less tension there, although it still existed. And his paintings mm. there were very subtle, pointing out the differences. And um, he also did a series in Trinidad a year later where he represented the different cultures living together by the different collages from um, foreign newspapers. He had Russian, he had London, he had Chinese. Um, the message being all these cultures are living together. Um, mm. But he noticed that there was still tension between the different races, but it was very subtle. Um, I remember they had a gallery at the Lewis State Bank. I think it was called the Little Gallery. It was in downtown Tallahassee. And he had some of those paintings up there. And I remember him telling me, you know, you can get your message across and the people who are open to the message will get mm -hmm. it and the other people won't get it. So, you know, he was, he was speaking to a certain audience mm -hmm. and uh, I, I do remember that conversation we had looking at those paintings in the, in the window of the little gallery. He got his message across and the, the drawings, the Albany, Georgia drawings, and you have a bunch of those in the show, Linda put together the civil rights show, um, yeah. are very immediate and very strong. And they were done very quickly. And they were done from what he saw on television, mm. not That's from what he saw on site. When we were little, we did not have TV and, and I, scouted the neighborhood for every house that had little children and television and volunteered to babysit there so that I could put the kids to bed and watch TV. Well, okay, I was the wrong daughter for them to have. Oh. I was a shy kid and I was easily spooked. I had a vivid imagination and his studio, okay, the house was, like I said, it was hung on a cliff. Mm -hmm. So you walked in to the upper level and that was the living room. Mm -hmm. And then you went down a half level and off to the side was the studio. And then you went down the other half level and the bedrooms were kind of slung underneath that. And I was not allowed in the studio. Probably, well, the first, the, the myth is I painted myself blue as a little kid. <laughs> they had me all dressed up for some party and they went to get me to show me off and I had taken off all my clothes and painted myself blue. Oh. So, um, but if you think about it, it was 
dangerous because he was using encaustics at that point in time. So there was a hot plate with melted wax and there was a blowtorch. And um, so it was not a good place for me to be. And uh, it also was kind of a creaky place. You know, it was had shadows and stuff. And it, I didn't like to go in there particularly. I was the darling daughter and he viewed being a painter as somewhat of a struggle and didn't want that for me. Mm. So even if I had shown talent, if I had shown the dedication that he had, I think he would have supported me, but um, I didn't. And so, you know, I, I painted as an exercise, as, as a challenge, but not with that driving force that he had. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had to paint, he, he couldn't do anything else. Okay, I have a theory that there are visual people that see their language is visual. And mm -hmm. I think he was one of those. And I think he saw everything visually. He was, he could, you know, he could speak and all that, but when you read all the articles, those were kind of ghosted by mother. And um, when you when you see everything like that, and as in terms of a visual, that's how you communicate. And so, you know, you and I are talking to each other. Um, he would have been painting a picture. Mm -hmm. Did he make pieces quickly or did he take a long time? Very quickly, very out? quickly, very quickly. And if you if you read the doc, uh, watch the documentary, you've got David Aronson in there um, demonstrating how Zerba created and it's pretty funny. And uh, but it was it was very quick and he was he was that's why he got into encaustic is because oil is so slow. You have to um, wait for layers to dry before you can go in and do something else. With encaustics, it's instant drying. And so you can just put, the, put it on there and you can layer immediately and you can use the blowtorch to meld the layers together. And uh, it's very quick. And his, his mind just moved too fast, I think, for oil, oil paints. He, he read there, was, there were some people that had experimented with it in, in Germany, and there were some books of, about methods and media that he was reading. And he came across encaustic, and he thought, hey, this looks like a good idea that I could do that. So he basically re, reinvented it in this country, redeveloped the procedure, the process. And um, came up with two formulas, one for canvas and one for masonite, which was his other support that he used. And mm. uh, identified strongly with it, which is why it was so traumatic when he developed the allergy to it and had to give it up. Right, because it's rather toxic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What he had was an open hot plate in the middle of the room and he put the pigment on the hot plate and the wax in the pigment and he mixed it together and he was leaning over and breathing it in. Mm -hmm. David Aronson, who was one of his students at the museum school, also was an encaustic painter. He saw what happened to my father. Mm -hmm. Look at his studio when you see the interviews. There are exhaust pipes everywhere. There it is. <laughs> He's not breathing anything. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what they gather is that the fumes from the pigments on the hot plate were what he developed the reaction to. Mm. And uh, I remember at that time, he was thin and getting thinner. We were cleaning because we thought it was house dust. We had the cleanest house in New England. And uh, then they finally figured out, you know, bit the bullet and admitted that it was the encaustic and that he had to give it up. The last painting he did in encaustic, except for the demonstration that he did um, at FSU, was the self-portrait of himself as Job. Oh. And that is, um, you can see that image 
at the um, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It's in their permanent collection. But it's, it's a very anguished self-portrait. You know, he was becoming pretty well known because of it. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden he had to give it up. And then all of a sudden there he was, no language again. Mm. Um, at that point in time, he had a student, Al Duca, who was experimenting with the very early plastics, um, polymer tempers, um, polyvinyl acetate. And he was trying to come up with a plastic paint, which of course evolved into acrylics. My dad and, and Al Duca worked together with this um, polyvinyl acetate, which became called polymer tempera. And again, it was a quick drying medium. So he could, he could paint in that totally different feel to those. And you have some in your collection. Mm -hmm. um, as well as some encaustics, so people can compare them. And um, it was, you with, with the encaustic, you could go in with a blowtorch and melt it and get a softer look to it. Mm -hmm. With the um, polymer tempera, it was a harder medium. It was more brick-like. One of the things he used to do when he demonstrated it was to take a hammer and hammer it, say, see, it's indestructible. <laughs> and uh, so wow. that was a different feel. And that was his intermediate uh, medium that he worked in, mm -hmm. um, in the 50s. Okay. And then um, he had a, a friend, Lenny, Leonard Bocour, who was an art materials guy in New York City who came up with Magna, which is an acrylic that's oil miscible. It's a turpentine based acrylic. And that again, gave him the option of the more fluid approach. Mm. So his later works are in that. Well, I can definitely see the chemistry influence coming through. Yes. And if he hadn't had that early lecture about you have to do something to earn a living, he would have been stuck in oils and who knows where he would have gone. Maybe nowhere. I mean, you just don't know. Right. Under every abstract expressionist work has mm -hmm. to be the skeleton. And when he went to art school, they spent a lot of time on drawing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, you, it, you don't just start out splashing stuff about. Right. You start out with a firm foundation and then from there, you go with your, your, you add your emotions. But mm -hmm. if you don't have that strong underpinning, it's not going to be a good work of art. It really just isn't. It was a tool. Mm -hmm. It was, it was something you needed to have. You, when you build a house, you need a foundation. Mm -hmm. um, it was, and, and he taught his students the same thing. You know, you, you have to have the strength, the underlying foundation and then you put yourself into it on top of that. That's how he taught his students. He didn't teach his students how to be expressionists or anything mm -hmm. like that. He, he figured their personality was their business. How mm -hmm. they, how they, whether they were photorealists, whether they were expressionists. Um, you look at Ellsworth Kelly, um, who was very hard geometric shapes. Um, all his students are different and, and he encouraged that. He, he did not want anyone to paint just like him. You know, there was no ego in it. His job was to give them the tools and turn them loose. Did he like teaching? It sounds like he did. He did, he, and he loved his students. He really loved his students. And um, in, in a sense, the older he got, they kept him young. Um, <laughs> he recognized the difference between the students he had in Boston and the students he had in Tallahassee because there's a difference between art school students and university students who also have to take all the gen ed classes and stuff like that. But he was excited by that and it forced him into being more introspective about his own, about his own processes. You know, he couldn't just wing it. He had to say, well, why am I doing this? What am I doing? How do I teach? 
these steps to somebody else. So um, it, it disciplined him. Mm -hmm. And like I said, he, he really loved his students. He had yeah. students who were friends his whole life. Um, there was a program in the mid fifties that uh, Florida State was coming up with, which was a kind of a, a, an advanced humanities program. And they had a professional musician, a professional co composer who was Doc Nani. They had a professional um, philosopher. They had, uh, and he was their artist. Okay. So they had people on the faculty who were known for excellence in their field. And you took classes with those people to get that higher level mm -hmm. of, of excellence. That's a great and idea. I think he was brought down to be their artist. Um, he had arthritis. Okay. And the older he got, the worse it got. And so the cold, damp was very hard on him. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, really, he really kind of suffered through the winters. And then he got to Tallahassee and he thought, wow, you know, this is really great. I don't hurt anymore. And uh, also he liked the, um, the more relaxed nature of the South versus New England. Mm. It was, it, he really enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, he, he liked Tallahassee a lot. He wrote a letter to one of his dealers, who, his, when he moved to Florida, when he made the decision to stay in Florida, mm. because everybody said, okay, He's just going for a year. Nobody panic. He'll be back. And after a year, he decided, well, I want to stay down here. And some of the people were horrified and they said, well, what are you going to do about segregation? What are you going to do about all this kind of stuff? And he said, well, you're kind of right in what you say. You know, you've assessed the situation correctly. And, but look at the atmosphere, look at everything else that's down here. He said, it's kind of a, a balance. The Tundra series, which was to my mind, and you have some in your collection, um, that was as close to a really joyful discovery that came out of nowhere and, and surprised him um, that I am aware of in his, all his series that he did. But um, it started as a birding trip. They went up there to see a migration in Churchill. And uh, so he figured, okay, Canada, tundra, it's gonna be all gray, it's gonna be boring. And he went up there and he found the, the spring, summer of, of tundra up there with all the color and everything and, and uh, did that series from that and that surprised him mm. and really delighted him. And he, he just, at that point in time, at least said he thought that was the best series he had ever done. Mm. So he was excited about that because it was a new discovery. Um, right. he, he liked the jungles in, in um, uh, he went down to the jungles in Brazil to, to look for hummingbirds. <laughs> And was, was really impressed. And that's where all the leaf collages come from, was that um, you know, he wanted to do something with the jungle. Mm -hmm. But everybody painted the jungle. So he said, what am I going to do that's different? And he got the concept of why don't I do collages and use real leaves? Mm -hmm. And at the same point in time, the um, Sherman Williams Company had come up with their artistic fluorescent paints, which, what did they call them? I forget, uh, wind glow or something like that. Mm -hmm. And because he was known for being willing to experiment with new techniques, people would send him stuff and Sherman Williams sent him stuff. And they said, we're developing this new fluorescent paint. Mm -hmm. Would you experiment with it and write us back and tell us what you think? So he said, sure. 
And so when you look at the fluorescent, the, at the leaf collages, a lot of them incorporate that fluorescent paint, which was perfect for the vividness that he was looking for. Right. That's why they're all behind plexiglass and not glass. It's because the plexi is a ultraviolet screening mm -hmm. um, plexi, not just regular plexi. I really like the stuff from the 60s. Um, I find a lot of his figurative stuff kind of scary. Um, again, you know, I wrong daughter. <laughs> but the, the anecdote about that was in, in our house, we had Zerbas on the wall when I was growing up, and of course, everywhere. And um, he once made the mistake of asking me what my favorite picture on the wall was. He had a painting by another artist. Oh no. <laughs> on the wall. And I went right to that one and I said, that's my favorite. And it was a Jack Levine. <laughs> so it didn't ask me anymore. But uh, I like the stuff from the 60s. I'm just very attuned to it. It's mm -hmm. I like the leaf collages a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, they should have been differently framed. I wish he had been talking to me at the time. And I would have said, you know, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. The, um, I don't know if you have any of the ones with the theater gel, but we're responsible, my husband and I, for that whole series. And that whole series ran into technical difficulties after he died. He didn't realize this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. But um, we took him and he came to see us. We were living in San Francisco. And he came to see us and meet his grandchildren. And we took him to a light show, a hippie yeah. light show. <laughs> and um, it was really pretty funny because my husband and, and my dad were dressed in suits and mother and I were dressed up because we'd just been out to dinner and we dropped in. So here's this guy who comes in and he, what he did, he didn't do sketches on site, he took notes. Mm -hmm. So here's this elderly gentleman in a business suit who walks into a light show, looks around, whips out a notebook and starts writing stuff down. Well, immediately they thought narcs. Oh. <laughs> and they came over. <laughs> who is he? What is he doing? And, and mother's job was to calm everyone down. Said, That's okay. He's an artist. He's just taking notes. But he got the concept of using theater gel as one of his collage materials. And it turns out that theater gel, if you're not very, very careful in your handling of it, mm -hmm. um, warps badly. And mm -hmm. so so the, the paintings he did in that, most of them are very badly warped. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people try and say, oh, he did that on purpose. I said, no, he didn't do that <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> it, was, it was an error. I have a checkered career because basically my father's um, idea about what I should do with my life is grow up and marry somebody, you know, get my MRS at college. Oh. And um, I, I majored in psychology. I was only there for a couple of years and then I dropped out and um, came back and, and got, um, administrative jobs at FSU, uh, secretarial jobs, uh, administrative assistant jobs, that kind of thing. Um, was secretary for the science camp one year and, you know, just did a whole bunch of different secretarial and administrative type things, mm -hmm. which got me into that. So then when we moved to San Francisco, I did more of that. Um, when we moved to Iowa, I started doing some pastels and I hadn't really done much artwork at all. And I, so I was doing pastels and there was a local art group there, not of the caliber of Lemoyne, but the same idea of local artists banding together, which is how Lemoyne kind of started out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I joined that. And from there, 
I got a job. I got into watercolors and I got a job with the Iowa Arts Council. They had a program where they taught art to senior citizens throughout mm -hmm. the state. And we had a, a branch, a, a grant for that in our town. So I was the drawing and watercolor and acrylic person. And someone else did the oils because I hated oils. And uh, <laughs> family resemblance, I didn't like oils. And uh, mm -hmm. so from that, I started studying watercolor and entering contests and things like that. And uh, from that, we had a local museum in town and I went to the director and said, what do I need to do to have a show here? And she said, well, you need to get into our juried show. And I said, okay, I can do that. So I started entering the juried show, got into the juried show and went back to her and said, okay, I got in your juried show. Now I would, what do I need to do to have a show? And they gave me a show. So we got to know each other. And as also an educator with the Iowa Arts Council grant, um, she thought of me as somebody who might be able to resurrect their um, educational program, which had kind of fallen apart. They were having a lot of trouble getting people, students and things like that. So she got me a little mini, mini, bitty grant, 500 bucks, if I remember correctly. She said, oh, right. take all these records and sort them out and see if you can come up with some kind of a plan. So I did. And the next thing I knew I was working there and uh, I, it evolved into a full-time education coordinator job. And um, I developed a program for, I, I resurrected their program and added onto it. And when we, by the time we ended up, we had, um, little baby classes for 18 month old kids. We had art and music. Then we had the kitty programs and we had uh, teen programs. And then we had the senior programs. And then we had outreach programs going throughout the community. And uh, so it, it, was, it was a fun job. I got to do a lot of research. Um, I had some awesome teachers. Um, who, who, you know, just did an incredible job because I was not real fond of teaching. <laughs> Unlike my father, I was not real fond of teaching. But um, that was basically my path until I retired and came down here when I was 70. And um, I think if I could have gone back and lived my life over again, I would have probably been an art historian because somebody somewhere ought to write a book on Zerva. Yes. And, and uh, you know, I have material, but I don't have the ability to write a book. When, when father died, he in his will, which I don't think he ever read, I think he just signed it. He left a lot of stuff to FSU. Mm -hmm. And mother called FSU and said, what do I actually need to give you? And they said, you have to give us everything that does not have to do with running the business, you know, with, with the galleries and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened after that. But she left the house to my aunt and my aunt decided to sell the house. And I got a call from my uncle who said, come down and get everything you want out of the house because we're selling it. Okay, fine. So I went down and literally in the middle of the living room floor with these gigantic cardboard boxes with papers just pitched in there. So I said, oh, <laughs> this must have something to do with running the business. So we packed up these boxes just as was, took them back up to New England, and I sorted them out as best I could. And I now have a series of scrapbooks, articles, um, very few letters, um, mm. photographs of paintings and things like that, catalogs and stuff.
So I sorted all that out and that's what I have. And uh, when I die, that is going to the Smithsonian to the Archives of American Art. They have requested it. They have, they have the some of the stuff I sent when I moved down here and uh, the reference materials I brought with me and th those will go off. But um, wow. what a life. He was raised by German parents, but his mother did have some Italian in her. Um, <laughs> he was um, old school as far as how a house should go, but he was no way strict. And, um, mm. you know, we, we had a lot of fun, but um, he kept his professional life separate from his family life, if that makes sense mm. to you. I mean, um, once a year in Boston, the students came for a cookout. Don't think he did that in Tallahassee. I think he had too many students in Tallahassee. It would not have been possible to do. But um, he didn't talk around me. He might have, he probably did to mother, but he didn't talk to me about painting and, and you know, his work. It was how to serve a tennis ball. It was <laughs> how to play ping pong it was uh you know it was family stuff and okay. it was pretty ordinary i noticed and and i wrote this in my article in the um the brochure of the catalog that came out with the zerba festival the first one in 89 mm -hmm. um i noticed that my the parents of some of my friends sniped at each other and argued with each other. And, and I asked him once, I said, how come you and my mother don't yell at each other and fight? And he got this horrified look on his face. He said, I am a gentleman. <laughs> and so he had a code of conduct that uh, probably came from his, his upbringing that, mm -hmm. you know, there was appropriate behavior and there was inappropriate behavior and you didn't treat your family like that mm. and uh, so I don't know it's pretty ordinary to me I don't know how he got initially involved other than that he was Carl Zerba and you know I, I don't know if Dick Puckett sought him out or if you know how that all started but mm. he was very supportive of Lemoyne from the beginning as far as I know and um, did the serographs as a, a benefit to Lemoyne and gave advice and, and uh, just thought they were a really good group worthy of, of support and that they were supporting the artistic community as such, you know, and that, you know, he was, he was really good friends with, with Dick Puckett and, uh, so he got in the habit of doing what he could for Lemoyne, and I figured it's got to be right. If he can do it, I'll do it, you know. And and so I just kind of continued where he left off. And then when Dick Puckett did the uh, documentary, I donated. You know, I was working with 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 Dick on the documentary. And I, he said, I want to do this. And, and he said, I had promised, you know, and they started it. They, and then my dad got too sick and they couldn't go any further. And then um, Dick said, let's, let's finish this. It was 80, I want to say 87, 88 when they started it, 89 when the festival was. And um, so my contribution to that other than saying I want script approval um, which I got was um, I donated paintings to various people in the community they would buy the paintings and donate the money towards the uh, documentary which I was not cheap I, I think we I I think we ran up to around 70,000 on it yeah it was not cheap 
Um, but there were a lot of people in Tallahassee that thought this was a wonderful thing to do. And I jumped at the opportunity. I said, yeah, what can I do? But it was, it was just a wonderful thing that they did and uh, got some of the footage that they had taken the first time they tried it is in there. The, uh, everything with um, Dr. Jansen is from the original footage that they took. And uh, they just did a great job. And, and so I've just always been supportive. And then of course, Linda Van Beck, they, they, Dick Pocket had the idea of a Serba collection. Mm -hmm. And there was some board, board member back then who agreed with that. It was way back in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And um, then for some reason, the, the financing fell through. And I remember Linda telling me that she saw mother and mother said, can you please? And Linda has taken this on as a, a wonderful project. And really, you know, she is responsible for a lot of those paintings that are, are on your website. You know, I look at that and I say, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's how that collection has evolved as far as I know is um, she's been very dedicated to that. But how can we, and what do you think is important for young people or people that don't know about Zerba to like know as his legacy and get them involved and interested? In well, I, I thought about that. That was one of the questions you sent me. And you know, the, the pat cliche answer is study his artwork and, and there are plenty of articles out there. Um, watch the documentary, mm -hmm. go see the collection, um, tie him in with history because what his work is, is his voice about what was going on around him. Um, when you look at the leaf collages, okay, those were inspired by Brazil. A lot of them have the fluorescent red in the background. That's when they were burning down the rainforest, you know, and everyone was involved in that. Um, the uh, the work in your civil right collection um, had to do with that moment in time. The World War II had to do with that, you know, that moment in time. And so what you're seeing is a history of his life and his take on what was going on all the way through. And the other thing that I got to thinking about is his um, students. Mm. You know, he didn't stop just with a bunch of paintings on the wall. He taught people and those people taught the next generation and it goes forward and you can, if, if you're an art historian and I say, I wish I'd become one, um, you can follow this all the way through and you can do it with individual artists, you can do it with movements. Mm -hmm. And it's really pretty exciting stuff to me. Um, so if kids are interested in this sort of thing, you know, you can start anywhere and just keep going to see what is the next link and go that route. Uh, never hurts to learn more about what people saw in their generation, in their time, and how, in, in the case of father, how it changed over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at the early works and you have a couple, I noticed in your collection. Okay, what he was doing then was um, mostly traveling around in France and traveling around and he had no money. And you, if you look at his titles, you can almost follow train tracks. And what he was doing, and we taught this a class with our kids at, in uh, my program at the Muscatine Arts Center, um, is he would go in and he would say, I'm an artist or I'm a painter, 
I will do a painting for you. Can I have supper? <laughs> and so he would trade his way through. Wow. And um, the, so, you know, the works from then are works that an innkeeper would want to have. Mm. And uh, it's it's just fascinating to me, uh, you know. It's, somebody should write a book. 